in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a new multi-axial element uh, that is able to capture axial shear and moment interaction, as well as all the salient failure modes in reinforced concrete columns. Here at the University of Texas at San Antonio, I'm working under Professor Kenum and Professor Matmor's supervision. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my former colleague, uh, Dr. Ariel Susello, the former PhD student here. He has done a lot in this project. Uh, this topic has, uh, is part of a funded project by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, quick overview, motivations and objectives, what the project is about, uh, then I'd get into the process and the modeling framework we have selected. Then I talk about the multi-axial element and multi-axial material model that we have developed in OpenSys, along with their new features, backbone, cyclic, uh, new damage functions, and so on. At the end, I'm gonna talk about how we integrated all the failure, failure rules and coupling behavior into our new multi-axial element. Quick motivations, uh, well, the, pic the, the figure on the right shows the Mexico City earthquake um, only a handful of buildings collapsed during that event, whereas the codes are telling us a lot more should collapse as they are sometimes a bit, uh, quite a bit conservative. Um, well, if we want to be that conservative, especially for retrofitting purposes at regional level, that would cause too much for society. Um, it, was, it was kind of when uh, the team started to look for a more advanced simulation to to assess the performance of these buildings better. Um, one point here, well, to get to that better performance assessment, we really need to simulate the full loss of member strengths. Otherwise, we cannot take advantages of all the redundancies and load redistributions. Also, we need the tool to help us make decision about those buildings, how repairable they are, how badly their damage would be. Um, so, and in other words, they need to tell us the damage state, um, not just the force deformation that we cannot do much with them. Uh, the objective here is really to develop enhanced simulation capabilities for reinforced concrete columns subjected to severe earthquake event. The purpose is really to facilitate the pre-event and post-event decision-making by the engineers. What we are proposing here is a tool that can simulate all the salient modes of failure uh, of reinforced concrete columns in a building up to complete axial load, axial collapse. Uh, for that, we are coupling all the axial shear and flexure degrees of freedom. We are also looking into cyclic effects and damage progression, as well as biaxial effects, what happens if you shake a building in two directions. In addition to regular columns, uh, the tool also is capable to simulate the behavior of retrofitted columns. We intended the model to be self-calibrating where the user only input the column geometry, section property, and these simple things. We would also like to output the explicit damage state, uh, how would the column would look like at the end of the analysis. Um, having all these features, the tool can get a good estimate of residual capacity as well. Uh, here I'm gonna talk about the modeling framework we have selected uh, because we wanted computational efficiency, we went for a coupled bond plasticity framework. Uh, this method is also easier to calibrate and control, especially in the post capping range where the failure starts. Uh, we, we propose new uniaxial material models in open seas, two for lateral modes, including shear and flexure, and one for axial mode, which is its behavior is quite bit different from the lateral modes. Then all these uniaxial material models got housed in a new multi-axial element where there they can talk to each other seamlessly and this is how we achieve the coupling behavior. Uh, so far the framework has been developed uh, in two dimension. In near future, we would uh, also like to um, expand the model in 3D as well. In the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about how we define the behavior of the rotational spring and shear spring, the lateral modes, um, based on our observations from column tests. First, backbone, um, well, nothing much fancy about the backbone. We just took the idealized shape of what we see in the column test, um, elastic branch, hardening branch, at the end of this branch, capping deformation, the point where the failure starts, the starts losing the strength and enters the degrading branch. Um, the backbone can be asymmetric, and we also added a little piece at the end to just bring down the force into zero. Um, most of the figures that I will show you in the next couple of slides are just about M and theta. 
The same things applicable is for uh, shear spring as well. For the cyclic behavior, however, the team spent quite a bit of time to get a simple mathematical expression to replicate the smooth changes of the stiffness along the unloading and reloading branches. Um, the team offered um, a new spline curve model that only needs three physically meaningful input parameters, including unloading stiffness, reloading stiffness, and the energy ratio, which is the energy inside the hysteresis slope divided by the maximum um, energy in an elastoplastic system, as you see in gray, green area. We also wanted the model to be able to capture the pinching behavior that we see in some of the column tests. Um, having the spline curve model by just adjusting the unloading, reloading, and energy ratio, uh, you can possibly transform a big loop like you see in gray into a more pinched behavior as you see in the blue. Um, column tests uh, also reveal that as you um, push the column farther and farther out from the yielding point, the hysteresis loop get bigger and bigger. To capture such a behavior, the team has related the energy ratio to secant the slope, which is the slope of the line that connects the maximum uh, deformation that have been achieved in either side of the backbone. Uh, so as you push the column farther and as this slope gets shallower and shallower, the energy ratio ramps up as the power here is negative. Um, but why uh, using a power function? Uh, because there is a clear trend between extracted energy ratio from the column test and the second slope to a power function as you see here. Um, column tests also show as you push the column farther out, from its yielding point, the unloading stiffness gets shallower. Um, the same thing happens for the reloading stiffness. They get deteriorated as you push the column further out uh, with the same um, concept as I explained for the energy ratio, unloading and reloading stiffness also have been related to the second uh, slope. And where as you push the column further out, as the slope of the line gets shallower, um, the, the unloading and reloading get a smaller value. Um, again, for example, for reloading a stiffness by using a power function, because again, the extracted reloading values uh, from the uh, column test show a very clear trend with the second slope through a power function, as you see here. Next is damage functions. Well, the material model, our material model uses different damage functions to adjust its behavior during the cyclic. Uh, during the cyclic, I already talked about the um, stiffness damage mode, how the unloading and reloading get deteriorated and how the uh, model, how the material model is able to, is able to capture such a behavior. Um, next, I want to talk about the strength damage uh, in the hardening range first. Um, comparing two identical columns with different applied lateral loads uh, shows the one that has gone through more cyclic in the hardening range that starts losing the strengths at a lower deformation in compared with the other one. Uh, the material model uses an energy-based damage functions to capture such a behavior at every half cycle, it updates the failure points. And uh, this damage mode especially is important for um, adjusting the monotonic response based on cyclic response. Um, and in the pulse capping range where the failure starts at every uh, cycle, column test shows that every cycle in the pulse capping range shifts the degrading branch towards the origin. The material model uses again an energy-based damage functions to update the and shift the descending branch, the degrading branch towards the origin at every half cycle without contacting the backbone in the other side. This is also another feature of this model where especially it becomes important in um, long duration motions where these motions may not push the column uh, back and forth all the way to the backbone. Um, so far I have explained about uh, how we define the behavior of lateral modes, the rotational spring and the shear spring. I talk all about the backbone, uh, cyclic and damage functions. Here, I'm gonna talk about how by gathering all degrees of freedom in one multi-axial element and one multi-axial material, uh, we make the tool capable of capturing coupling behavior as well as failure, different failure modes. I'll start with the failure modes. 
Uh, prior reaching the full yield moment of strength, so the material model checks for two uh, possible modes of failure, splice and shear. Um, well, if the uh, provided lap splice is too short, well, it, such a mode would get initiated, as you see here, before reaching the full yield moment capacity, uh, as you see in the dashed line. Also, uh, for the shear, if the shear demands goes beyond the uh, shear yield strength, this mode also would get initiated, as you see here. Uh, however, if none of these conditions uh, met during the analysis, and actually it could reach the full yield moment of strength, then the material model start checking for flexure, flexure shear, and flexure splice mode of failure, and initiate the one that has a lower deformation capacity. For example, here, um, flexure splice uh, has been initiated because the, the deformation capacity for this mode has been lower than the flexure shear and the flexure mode of failure. Uh, or in this example, because we didn't, that the column didn't have any lap splice issue, and because the flexure mode of failure has a lower deformation capacity in compared with the flexure shear, this mode get initiated. Here, there are a few um, points that I need to explain. Um, first is, um, the material model also adjusts the cycle behavior due to the, uh, that a specific mode of failure that has been governed. For example, in a splice mode of failure, you would expect to see a more pinched behavior as opposed to a flexure mode of failure. The other point, the other important point here is that none of these transition surfaces remain constant during the analysis. Meaning that, for example, for a flexure, mode of failure because the capping deformation, the point where failure starts, as it has been related to the applied axial demand, the capping deformation changes during the analysis as the axial demand changes. Um, next, for example, in a splice mode of failure, the degrading stiffness has been related to the amount of uh, shear demand. So it, the material model keeps changing the stiffness of this um, line during the analysis. The important point here is that the rotational spring can adjust its behavior based on axial demand and shear demand because by gathering all degrees of freedom in one multi-axial element, rotational spring actually has a direct access to shear demand and axial demand. Of course, here I just explained a few examples for the rotational spring. Shear spring also can adjust its behavior based on rotational demand, flexure demand, and the axial demand. Uh, in addition to that, we also implemented the PM interaction, the classic PM interaction inside the material model where rotational spring adjusts its hardening branch at every increment based on the applied axial demand. Uh, this is quite that new uh, within the lump plasticity framework. Here is just one example application. Uh, so for example, uh, the figure here shows the moment versus uh, uh, rotation for the rotational spring at the bottom left here, as you see. Um, well, when you um, pull the frame to the left as the axial demand increases in this column, as the axial load increases the moment um, yield the strength goes around 6,000 here. However, as you push the frame to the right and as the axial demand decreases, the moment the demand also, the moment uh, yield the strength also decreases up to 5,000 in the other side. Uh, another unique feature of the multi-axial material is that it output parameters uh, related to the level of damage of the column at the end of the analysis in a text file in a tabular format. Uh, for example, we can find the deformation at yield, deformation at capping, uh, where the failure starts. It tell you, tells you the governing mode of failure. For example, one denotes to flexure mode of failure. Then, well, as you... Um, See the flexure mode of failure, you probably would expect that the, um, of course you would expect that the, uh, the full yielding moment, the strength should be reached as it shows here. Not only it tells you that, but also it tells you that, for example, how much of the shear strength capacity has been reached as you reach the yield moment, the strength. In other words, how far you are away from such a brittle uh, mode of failure. 
Here are some examples uh, that we repl replicated the experimental data, the column test. Um, on the left, I, here I brought some best fit uh, to kind of um, uh, see how model would work, the capability of the model, if it can match uh, closely and replicate closely the, what we see in the uh, cyclic behavior of the column test, um, one for flexure mode, one for shear mode. And also on the right, I selected some of the calibrated version, how it predates the column behavior on the, under uh, cyclic loading, one for flexure shear, one for a splice. I really try to be fair and not select those that closely match. Uh, so th these are not the best match that I have, uh, just some fairly kind of in a not very bad way. Um, we also tested the uh, performance of the model against uh, measured data from uh, physical structure tested to collapse. Uh, it was tested dynamically. Um, not only the model predicts all the modes of failure cor correctly, two sets for flexure, two sets were for flexure shear, but also it could adequately represent the force deformation we saw here. It's just one example uh, for the base shear versus the first story drift ratio. That's all. Thank you all for your attention and time. I would be more than happy to answer any question. If there is any, I also put my um, email at the end. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me if you had any questions.